Welcome to everybody. As president of Kivitas, our international network of archives, institutions, individual scholars devoted to research on Christian democracy, I wish to welcome all participants of this third seminar on peace and Christian democracy. Today's seminar will be our last webinar before summer. In late September and October, we will promote two more seminars. We are still working on them, but we hope to have Professor Martin Conway of Oxford University and Professor Peter Rugenthaler of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute for Kriegsfolgenforschung, Graz, Austria, for two new absorbing lectures. I wish to thank Loredana, Loredana Teodorescu, of the Instituto Sturzo for an outstanding work in preparation for these seminars. Well, in the first seminar, looking at the Italian case, we analyze the relationship between peace, ideology, party politics. In the second, devoted to Eastern Europe, we deeply examined the complex relationship between peace and human rights. And today we focus on another, I think, crucial area and on an illuminating topic. The title, Professor Bastian Matteo Shanna, whom I warmly thank for his kindness, gave us, is In Search of Peace and Security, the Christian Democrats and German Foreign Policy in the 20th Century, Germany was at the core of the peace and war issue. Its responsibility in the Second World War, its role in the Cold War confrontation, from the Berlin Bloc to the Berlin Wall, which became the symbol of the East-West divide. The outstanding preeminence that in German history anti-nuclear peace movements exerted, all this makes the German case, I think, particularly interesting. And then there is security. The problem of combining peace and security is one of the more difficult in peace efforts. Some scholars even suggest a security dilemma, which can be solved only by groupings of states developing into a community. And I imagine this relation between the national and the international dimensions will be relevant to the reflection Professor Shanna will share with us. I wish only to add some, a few words to introduce Professor Shanna to the audience. The senior lecturer uh, at the chair of war studies at the history department of the University of Boston and program coordinator of the MA program, War and Conflict Studies and International War Studies. He has received grants and fellowships from the German Historical Institute, the European People Party, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. Its main research interests are on German foreign policy in the 20th and 21st century, on European integration history, but also Austrian and Italian history. I'm really pleased about this. In 2019, he published a book, The Italian War on the Eastern Front, 1941-1943, Operation Smiths and Memories with Palgrave. In 2021, together with Sünke Neitzel, he published another book on the German role in the Syrian war. And his recent articles concern also German practices against civilians during the Franco-Prussian War, or the case of the Italian peacekeeping operation in Lebanon. So as you see, I think it is difficult to have a better speaker for today's subject. Well, thank you again, Professor Sharna. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Mora, for these nice words of introduction. And I would also like to extend my, my gratitude and thank for, for Loredana for putting this together and for inviting me to, to be part of this series and to, to speak to you today. 
As you mentioned, um, it is Germany was very much at the core of many developments um, in the 20th century, and I would claim also in the 21st century. So um, what I'm trying to do today is, um, as you alluded to, combine these strands of peace and security, the, the strife and the search for, for peace and security, and extend this also to the, the Merkel era, which is becoming more and more historical. Uh, we lived through it, we, we saw it, and we saw it end. And I think we can also start as historians to look at this period. And um, I will, in, in one or two occasions, um, uh, look more at the German uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia or the Soviet Union. This is uh, for obvious reasons, but there's also a specific reason. I'm writing a book currently on, on Germany's Russia policy since the end of the Cold War. And I've been mining sources and I've been freeing sources for the 1990s and early 2000s. So um, I think this is also an approach where I would say um, us historians must also look um, at, at things that uh, not only um, Adenauer and Kohl, as, as nice as it is to research these times, but also at more recent times. So let me start by looking at uh, one or two main points or questions. So there's going to be two German words I will not introduce to you because you probably know them already, but two German words I will repeat repeatedly. One of that is going to be Ost. So, Eastern policy, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the East, meaning the Soviet Union, the, the Eastern Bloc, the Warsaw Pact states, and, and then Central Eastern Europe and Russia after 1990, 1991. German word I will often refer to is Westbindung. So an alignment with the West, um, I will talk about that plenty. And I will try to answer the question I said to myself, not only in, in looking at what is Christian democracy and peace and security mean, but also is there or, or was there rather a genuine Christian democratic identity policy after 1945? Because when we speak about Ostpolitik, the social democrats in Germany, the SPD, often to claim this word as their genuine strand of foreign policy. They probably used to do this more and more vehemently before Putin's second war against Ukraine. But I think we're seeing a trend of re-evaluating politic actually meant and who stands for Ostpolitik. Was there a CDU Ostpolitik, so to say? And then I will also look at differences between the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, and the CSU, the Bavarian Sister Party, because very often they were not in line when it came to foreign policy. There were many, and I would argue also bloody quarrels between these parties. And another aspect that I want you to bear in mind when I speak about this, it wasn't even when we look at the times where the Christian Democrats were in government, there were always coalition governments, right? So there's never a pure 100% policy coming, uh, coming out of the chancery just done by Christian Democrats. I will look also at how identity formation uh, was done by, by Westbindung. And I will look at sort of strands within the CDU also um, that show that there wasn't just one party line. So I will try to look also all this in 30 minutes, of course, I will try to look at uh, how were there different strands in, um, within the party when you look at um, uh, foreign policy making. So let me start with my first point, um, the, uh, the foundations of the Bonn Republic in terms of foreign policy. And I will set this period as, um, I mean, it's, it's nothing novel or, or world changing that I set this period from 1949. So the foundation of the German Federal Republic until 1958, where we have the first sort of uh, relance européenne completed with the treaties of Rome, the ratifications, uh, and also German NATO membership in 55. So what we have to bear in mind, we speak about a divided country, right? The, Germany was divided. There was a GDR. Germany, West Germany, that is, was only half sovereign. There were still allies there. West Berlin is still um, under um, sort of um, allied rule. Uh, you have a four-party rule um, in, in Berlin that, that cracks down quickly, but you still have the allies uh, in Berlin. Germany is, speaking of Berlin, a frontline state. It is not the classical, um, I introduce another German word, Mittellage. So it's not that Germany is in the center of Europe, 
between different states. It is still in the center of Europe, but it's very different during the Cold War than it is after 1990. And I will later allude to, to what I mean by that. And we have to bear in mind, there is the burden of the past. And by past, I mean the Nazi past. Um, there is a clear tendency that we have to look at German foreign policy in the 50s and 60s, and also later on, in terms of what happened before. We must never forget this. So one of the key questions when looking at German foreign policy and uh, in terms of peace and security was, of course, the strife and the wish and desire for reunification. But it always posed the question, at what cost should reunification be achieved and strived for? And there we have already, with Konrad Adenauer, the first German chancellor, one big issue within his party, because there were people in his party, like uh, Jakob Kaiser, um, who was um, heading the, the CDU in Berlin, who was very much favoring a unification, even though it wasn't really possible when we look at the sources today and see what the Soviet Union was actually thinking. But he was favoring a course towards peace through unification and probably also neutralization of West Germany or then a unified Germany. And Adenauer would always prefer um, a policy of Westbindung. Um, and, and that was also, that is usually seen as Jakob Kaiser is, is cited, but then there were others within the CDU who were pushing towards an earlier um, strive for unification, uh, such as Gustav Heinemann, who then leaves the CDU in opposition against rearmament. So Germany initially does not have an army. So security is an, uh, an issue that others have to care for, for the Germans for very good reasons when you look at the, the war before. Then there's also Eugen Gerstenmeier, who's one of the uh, most outspoken foreign policy experts in the CDU, who also kind of turns against Adenauer and wants to pursue a stronger reunification policy. So you see this duality between reunification, Deutschlandpolitik and Westbindung. Westbindung means that Adenauer says, um, it is very unlikely that we achieve a unification on our terms, terms that sort of would keep Germany democratic, uh, non-communist, uh, and, and would not give in to the Soviet Union. So what he pursues is a two-strand policy, which I think is, is the core even today of, of the CDU, and also in general of um, German parties and German foreign policy making. But it's, I would argue it's more enshrined into the party DNA of the CDU and CSU than other parties. Two pillars. One pillar is security. Uh, and the security pillar quickly becomes NATO, because the other the, the peace and sort of prosperity pillar as well as European integration. And I would argue that CDU is also um, the first party and the foremost party for a long time when it comes to European integration, because it, um, it, it combines these pan-European Christian values, anti-communism, um, freedom, free market principles, um, or special market principles rather probably than, than free market principles. And there is the idea that we should have a European defense community. When it fails in 54, because the, the French National Assembly votes it down, there is a problem of how do you achieve security? And then uh, the, the German rearmament becomes a very contentious issue. And, and the CDU has to, and, and the CDU have to fight for it and have to sort of um, achieve peace and security uh, by NATO integration. So the rearmament debate is, I think, um, also at the core of Christian, foreign, Christian democratic foreign policy, because the CDU CSU is in power. And it's very contentious and uh, also abroad, um, uh, seeing the Germans rearm isn't something uh, people uh, would for good reasons like in the 1950s. So I think this, this foundation period from 49 to 58 shows already that there are, because the Christian Democrats are in power, they're more linked to the key decisions that others oppose. Let's not forget the SPD was, uh, was opposing European integration for a long time. They had different ideas. Um, the, 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 the debate or rather the opposition against um, rearmament, so the foundation of, of the Bundeswehr, uh, was also deep in some parts of the SPD. Then we come to the second part. Um, I call this adjustments question mark. So a period between 1958 and 69. In 69, the Christian Democrats are voted out of office, Willy Brandt becomes chancellor. But between that, 
you have one thing where I think it is very clear that also within the city of CSU, there are different camps, there are different ideas of how one should approach um, peace and security. And the, uh, the, the most known sort of um, split is the big debate between the so-called Atlanticists and the so-called Gaullists within the city of CSU. That is a debate that starts already in the 1960s. And uh, I would argue at the core of this was the question, how do you balance relations between the United States and France? And what do you favor and why do you favor it? And I think the reason pretty much lay in the challenges presented uh, by the second Berlin crisis between 1958 and 62. Because at the core of the crisis, it is the question, how reliable are the United States as an ally? What if push comes to shove in, in, in West Berlin or in the Federal Republic and the Americans don't deem it necessary to cross the Atlantic and fight for German freedom? Then you had also the, the fear that um, uh, sort of a starting detente would be achieved between the superpowers overriding German interests. So the idea that what if peace and security is different defined in Washington or in, in Paris than it is defined in Bonn. And the split in the city would say is, um, was between the, the, the so-called Atlanticists so um, uh, then uh, Chancellor um, Erhard, um, his, his Foreign Minister Schröder and Defense Minister von Hassel, who argued very much that um, whatever happens, security and hence also peace in Europe can only be achieved by being ever closer to Washington and the US. I'm simplifying here. Um, and you have the Gaullists um, led by Adenauer, uh, who was sort of pushed um, out of office rather. Um, and then Franz Josef Strauss, um, and head of the um, Christian Social um, Union in, in, in Bavaria, and uh, zu Gutenberg also, um, who was also in the CSU. And they argued, and, and they were, I think, sort of mislabeled as Gaullists, that um, the, the European pillar, sort of um, their the concept was you had um, a free West that rested on two pillars the American or North Atlantic pillar, not to forget our Canadian friends, um, and the Western European pillar. And it wasn't meant to sort of be a rival towards the US or a neutral pillar between the superpowers. It was meant to be the second pillar of the free West um, sort of in, uh, in, in opposition to the, um, to the Soviet bloc. One detail, it, it doesn't really uh, affect European policies. For example, Franz Josef Strauss was, um, of course, vehemently in, um, in opposition to Erhard and Schröder for many reasons. Um, and the, the label Gaullist is somewhat wrong because he opposed uh, Charles de Gaulle's um, European policies, for example. So he, he, he liked the idea of a more European Europe in terms of security and, and sort of uh, defending European interests side by side with the Americans. But he didn't like the approach of, um, of Charles de Gaulle that he didn't want an ever closer union. So there we have to be careful with the labels, what they, what they actually mean. But um, so security um, for Germany could mean aligning with de Gaulle, but it, the second pillar, the sort of peace and prosperity European integration pillar, um, could mean something very different than what the goal was um, pursuing. When we look at these debates um, of the Atlanticists uh, against the Gaullists, it is very important to, um, to keep in mind that this was a terrible thing for the sister parties. And if we look at even debates in the 1980s and 1990s, you have uh, Helmut Kohl saying how he remembered how bitter these infightings were at that time. So it, it is really, um, uh, I would almost say, a traumatic experience. And we must not um, uh, overlook this. And uh, it became even more traumatic because um, it, um, it fueled a sense that this infighting and this bitter rivalry also led to the fact that one didn't find answers to the more pressing questions of how do you approach the Soviet Union um, in times of detente? And how do you react to the, uh, to the Ostpolitik um, of the new social liberal uh, government? And that is my third point. Um, the um, CDU-CSU had to find a role in opposition. 
So how do you achieve peace and, uh, and, and security when you are in opposition and when you are looking uh, at a government uh, that was perceived by the CDU, CDU, CSU as derailing the foundations of German foreign policy, i.e. Westbindung operating in, uh, in, in cooperation with the Western allies and, and the Americans. And what they perceived, um, uh, the, the Neue Ostpolitik of Egon Bahr and, uh, and Willy Brandt as, was sort of throwing that overboard and without guarantees and without backing of the uh, Western allies, pursuing a very difficult and dangerous uh, path in, in Moscow, um, Warsaw and, and, and East Berlin. And even there you see the, the opposition, it is not a time of unity for the Christian Democrats. So uh, you have very bitter opponents um, of the Neue Ostpolitik like to Gutenberg, like Strauss also to a lesser degree. You have a very unfortunate party leader in Rainer Barzel of the CDU who doesn't really know on which side to fall and uh, he's, um, he's a figure that is then sidelined quickly. And you have Helmut Kohl, he's, um, who's very soft-spoken uh, in, in this terms. He's not one of the cold warriors, if you will, who's vehemently opposed to the uh, Neue Ostpolitik. So it is very, it's a difficult time in opposition because also the, the party is not really used to it. But then the party comes back to power. And uh, as I mentioned before, Helmut Kohl, he becomes chancellor in 1982 and remains chancellor until 1998. And how, see, how, how he perceives um, his duty and also his, uh, his role as Christian democratic leader is very much in the tradition of Konrad Adenauer. Uh, he always saw himself as a disciple of Adenauer and hence putting more emphasis on Westbindung, uh, on European integration, on these traditional pillars from the first founding period I talked about earlier. So what you see uh, in the 1980s is a very strong push for European integration. Speaking of peace, Helmut Kohl always said that um, the, the Deutschland politics, so German unification and European uh, sort of German reunification and European unification uh, are once uh, two sides of the same coin, um, if, if, if that makes sense in English. Um, so it was always very much linked. His, his Deutschland politik was, uh, had its foundation in his European uh, integration policies. So he pushes um, European integration from what was then always perceived uh, as a time of Euroscolosis, so um, a standstill in European integration, even though scholarship has sort of revised that, that view of the 1970s, he clearly pushed um, as a very important figure um, uh, European integration uh, to the Maastricht Treaty, to the Amsterdam Treaty, uh, to sort of to the EU as we know it today. A second important decision um, that, that he pushed through uh, was the NATO dual track decision, right? Helmut Schmidt, um, his um, social democratic predecessor, failed in pushing it through because his own party wouldn't follow his tracks. And then you have Kohl sort of again pushing a security policy aligning Germany with NATO, securing its, uh, its interest in having the Americans on board in Europe. How did he do this? I think there's also um, important to note how, how Kohl saw the element of trust uh, personal trust, establishing personal relations with uh, also with, with Gorbachev and, and, and others as a very important tool in his foreign policy making, but also trust more general in the Federal Republic, right? The, um, Germany did not have a very good reputation uh, in the 20th century as a trustworthy ally. Um, I'm, I'm speaking and looking at many Italians here. Um, uh, it is... Uh, the, the foundation, uh, as, as Kohl always said, in, is trust in Europe. Also trust that smaller states believe uh, Germany wouldn't put their security interests above their security interests. And that becomes very important in the 1990s when um, these uh, Western institutions are pushed eastwards, right? NATO enlargement and EU enlargement always, um, th they weren't a given factor. In, in France, in Italy, uh, and in Britain, for other reasons, Britain was in favor of EU um, uh, Eastern enlargement, but Germany was always at the core of Eastern enlargement. Within NATO, we still have to see there are many documents that are still closed, but it's clear that Germany was also in general um, uh, in favor and, and leading the process. 
But there was always the, the danger that um, peace and security after the collapse of the Soviet Union and after German re reunification would mean placing German interests above the interests of the Central and, uh, and Eastern European reform states, say Poland, Hungary, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, also Ukraine and the Baltic states, in instead pursuing a policy of bilateral um, uh, agreement and, and rapprochement uh, with Russia. And I think the, the most important thing is that these institutions and that belief in institutions uh, for bringing peace and security was vital and was shaped and, and rooted in the 1950s and in that Adenauer experience that Kohl saw, because there were differences. Uh, when you look at the 1990s to early 1990s, the SPD and the F FDP, so the free liberals, they had different ideas. Um, the free liberals under foreign minister Genscher very much looking at the OSCE as a new security structure. Kohl initially also looked at that and tried to, to strengthen the, the Western European Union, yes, but it was always clear he would never allow NATO to become a less important role. And in the FDP, FDP and SPD, it looks different. So I think that there is a, a, a difference in, in terms of how do you see security structures in Europe in the 1990s between these parties. And you see this especially in terms of his, his Russia policy. That's, um, I'm, I'm just writing the, the part on the 1990s, how much he is focused. Yes, of course, he does not want to be Germany, uh, Germany to be a frontline state anymore. So you see very clear this German national interest by surrounding yourself with allies that are in the same institutions, that are in, in, in the same uh, defense uh, alliances, defensive alliances, you, you sort of, you serve German national interest, of course. Um, and there were Russian troops still uh, in, in the former GDR, um, so you have to take all this into consideration. But he was always looking, and he, I can say he and so much focus on Kohl because he was a very strong chancellor at that point. Genscher leaves office in, in 92, he becomes even stronger. Um, and he always looked at the Baltic states and Central European states and tried to align them to the EU as, uh, as quickly as possible. Kohl leaves office in 1998. Uh, then you have a period that uh, sort of is a changing times in German foreign policy and poses many questions that were posed before. The Iraq war, Schröder and Russia, sort of the, the social Democrats in power uh, and the Iraq war means Germany is at least on the side with France. Mm -hmm. But um, think of the uh, Gaullists and Atlanticists debate. Um, but uh, the the consequences for the relations to, to Washington uh, are immense. Uh, we tend to forget this, but it's, uh, it's very, it's not a high point, of course, of, um, of European uh, US relations, but especially not of US German relations. And Angela Merkel comes to power in 2005. So she in, inherits um, a situation that is very bad in terms of German foreign policy. And she's usually seen as someone who had no idea about German foreign policy, about, uh, about the world, because she grew up in Eastern Germany. I would argue it's nonsense. And, uh, and I have many documents where you can show she's very well versed in terms of international um, uh, affairs, um, foreign policy matters. She, she's very much uh, up to her game, if you will. And you see that she, she runs on a platform, of course, as a pro-American um, pro Atlanticist um, figure. And you see that um, she's sort of peace and prosperity and, and, and security becomes very much contended already during her first uh, period uh, in, in, in government, um, again, under um, a grand coalition. In 2008, you not only have the financial crisis, which leads to um, an EU-wide crisis, also in political terms, of course, you also have the Russian invasion of Georgia. So um, the question of how serious do you take uh, NATO, not only in terms of an organization that tries to sort of hunt down terrorists in, in, in the Hindukush mountains, but as an organization that defends the Baltic states um, uh, that, that have just been admitted, right? You have a second uh, or third round of Eastern enlargement. That already becomes a topic. And, and then it's still up for the debate and I don't have a final opinion on that, how much she actually cared about um, uh, securing 
the eastern flank and taking military matters serious um we can debate this um it's of course from a perspective of today everything is critical and everyone was stupid but i think we as historians we need to be a bit more sober in, in these assessments and, and, and look at sources um, if we get them uh, to sort of assess um, policy making but there's one case uh, i want to mention before coming to conclusion where you see Merkel was um, sort of, she ran as a pro-Atlanticist and she was clearly an Atlanticist, uh, but you see that also her decisions um, had to be taken uh, under consideration of coalition uh, agreements and of situational problems and domestic politics. Libya in 2011, right, the start of the Arab Spring, uh, Gaddafi is, of course, a nasty dictator, and you have the uh, UN security resolution coming up. Germany abstains, uh, abstains in the resolution um, with China and Russia and stands against the US and France. The first time in German history that you stand against both France and US as an ally. Huge political fallout, I think, even today, and it also plays to the, to the argument of German unreliability. And if you look at the criticism that Germany received for um, for her Russia policy um, since the, the Russian invasion, it is also at the core about trust. It's about trust and reliability. What are the Germans up to? Are they really reliable? Are they taking things serious or are they pursuing a, a different path? And I would argue maybe that just as an argument um, also with uh, many Italians here, there's a split in Russia policy. How do you see peace and security between sort of the Anglo-Saxons, the Eastern Europeans and the Balts, and the quote-unquote traditional Western Europeans, France, Italy, Spain, and Germany? And uh, I think that tends to be forgotten that you have different approaches in Europe to, to Russia. Um, so NATO and Bundeswehr, even after 2014, after the um, uh, annexation of Crimea by Russia, you could argue uh, Merkel was not really investing in uh, neither in peace or security in, in Russia or investing in it in a very sort of different way by um, continuing relations with Russia uh, and not investing in security. And, and one, uh, one could argue still talking to Russia made sense, but not taking the Bundeswehr and NATO goals seriously is, of course, one thing that you, you can sort of uh, push away. So, in conclusion, is there a genuine strand of Christian democratic foreign policy? Um, I would argue yes. It doesn't mean that it's the only party that has that strand, but I think it is more at the core of it. It's the idea of Westbindung, no experiments, right? As uh, Adenauer said in a campaign slogan, have a reliable Germany. That doesn't mean that Germany is also under Merkel, for example, taking turns that are unexpected or pursuing uh, national interests over common European interests, sure. But it's the idea that peace and security uh, through a strong link with Western institutions. And uh, some points in contrast to other parties, and uh, we can sort of think together and, and come up with more. Uh, within the CDU, there was never a strong current of anti-Americanism anti-US sentiments that you have clearly in the SPD uh, that links with anti-NATO um, uh, sentiments. And in the FDP, probably under Genscher more pronounced than, than afterwards, was always that um, at least perception also in the West, neutralist leanings that um, trend to see NATO not as important as, for example, the OECE, um, uh, European integration and the FDP is also, I would say, um, a different ball game than within the Christian Democratic Party. So um, when we look at this, I think you can see some some differences. So I would argue, yes, there's a, um, a genuine strand and, uh, and there are many arguments to be made about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shanna. It is exciting and very interesting uh, lecture, uh, a miracle of synthesis, I would say, with many suggestions on different aspects and uh, also some very interesting link with today's problems with Russia and the Russian-Ukrainian 
uh, conflict. Uh, I uh, thank you very much also for your use of time because this gives us more time than usual for an exchange of views, comments, or questions and observations. So I would uh, like to see if there is somebody who would like to intervene and ask you something in case I have uh, one question that I would like to, to ask you, but I, I will wait. I, I see a raised hand, Professor Kusters, please. Yes, um, <clears throat> at first um, you uh, give a whole picture of the very complicated problems uh, during the last uh, 40, 50 years of German foreign policy, of course. Um, I could mention or add a lot of things, but let me point out one, two decisive uh, uh, problems. Uh, the first problem is on the uh, view of a Christian Democrat. That's the German Christian Democrats, and I see a lot of Western um, Christian Democrats had one fundamental principle, and that is we do not want another war. That was as well as the attitude of the socialists and the liberals, but it was a question in how far could we guarantee this uh, principle. And there, there were a lot of different uh, opinions how to uh, secure, to rescue uh, the situation, not going into another war. And in so far, Adenauer and the Christian Democrats always following the principle, let us do it together with the Americans. It is not the question of an anti-Americanism, yes, of course, but in the first hand, it is a question how it is possible to uh, have a, a security for the Western part of Germany and for the Western world. And in so far, it was discussed in the uh, former meetings uh, of the Nouvelle Equipe Internationale. Uh, and that was a common basement for the Christian Democrats to see we want no other further war and that we have to do it together with the Americans. It was the decisive point, so far as I see, for the Italian uh, Christian Democrats uh, to go in this uh, direction as well in the uh, Netherlands or in, the, uh, in Belgium or as well in France. Uh, to see, yes, it is necessary. A second point I think is very important. There was always a question, how could we deal with the Russian imperialism? And I think Adenauer was quite clear, there is a certain form of Russian imperialism or Soviet imperialism, and we have to defend the Western world. That means in how far could we, the Germans, um, contribute anything to the security of the Western world? And that is a decisive point, but there were different interests. The first decisive point is that Adenauer renounced the using of ABC weapons uh, in the London Conference uh, 1954. It was uh, uh, reiterated and, and uh, uh, once again stressed by Kohl in the negotiation of the German unification in uh, 1990. He discussed it in Camp David uh, with President Bush. But it changed in this way the role of the German foreign policy. That was a decisive point. Up to 1990, it was quite clear, a non a departed German may have another international role leading by Christian Democrats. And now Christian Democrats are forced 
to change their position, their role in international relationship. And the, I think the decisive question is how to answer, on the one hand, to have a security situation for the Germany and for the Western world, and how to deal with Russia once again. What is the decisive answer of the Christian Democrats, not only in Germany, but in Western Europe as well? How should we deal with the new Russian experience? And in so far, Kohl is very uh, reluctant in his attitude, in his negotiations with uh, Bush and later on with Clinton on the question to expand the West, Western democracy towards Eastern Germany, towards as well Eastern Europe, and perhaps how it is possible to uh, a, a find a way of uh, cooperation with Russia. I think that is a very important point um, to deal uh, with the question uh, peace and war and, and the attitude of the Christian Democrats. The socialists and the social democrats are thinking quite completely different on the way uh, the Germans should go. I'm not quite clear if you are working on these questions. Could I directly? Yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> That's my concrete uh, uh, question. Uh, what do you think about these more general and fundamental positions of Christian Democrats to these fundamental questions, how to deal with Russia, how to um, uh, defend uh, our security in Western Europe, and uh, uh, which role should uh, uh, the United States play in, in the new world, and as well as the Germans in another situation after 1990? Yeah, many yeah. thanks indeed. Um, um, just to be clear, not to be misunderstood, I wasn't saying that there was a strand of anti-Americanism in the CDU-CSU. I was saying that there was um, in, in, in difference to the CDU-CSU, there's a strand of anti-Americanism in the SPD. And what I tried to say with, uh, with uh, Westbindung was that, uh, of course, the Americans were essential and getting them on board was essential for Christian democratic policy. So um, I completely agree with your first point. Um, the idea, not another war, get the Americans in peace and security. Um, I fully agree to that. Um, the, the, the second it, point... Uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting. One, one sentence. When you have a look at the attitude of the Christian Democrats, not only in Germany, but as well in Western Europe, to the Vietnam War, you see the dilemma of the Western uh, position. Uh, on the one hand, it was quite clear, uh, we, sh we have to, to support the Americans in, in, in Vietnam War, but on the other hand, it was very difficult inside here in Germany uh, uh, to, the, to the left uh, 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 positions. Sure, it's the same thing with the Iraq war in 1990-1991 that mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and also with getting the Americans on board to do something about Yugoslavia I, I mean it's it, it's very much it's always the the question hence I try to sort of um, to set out the um I mean the two strong points of German foreign policy um where or probably still are Washington and Paris and, and how do you deal uh, with that um uh, I fully agree so the question the, the second one, um, how to defend the West and, and deal with Russia? I mean, that's the one million dollar question. Um, I can only um, I can only try to talk about the the nineteen nineties. What uh, what Cole was was thinking, and it was um, I, I tend to disagree slightly in in terms of when did he try to push um, uh, Eastern enlargement. I think it was very early on that you had these association agreements. That you knew, um, yes, the Warsaw Pact is still in existence. Of course, in 1991, uh, there's no idea of extending NATO more eastward than to the GDR. Um, there are already first thoughts, and um, especially the Central Europeans tend to raise it. But one is very careful to make any precise comments on that because it's clear the Russian bear is still around. But then you have a period. So in this period, EU enlargement is sort of becoming more interesting as soon as you have Maastricht out of the way. And, it, and one is very hopeful that it's going to be quicker. But then you realize, 
oof, there are many problems with um, uh, agrarian policies and, and, and all these things. So EU enlargement becomes more blocked and more difficult. And you have the problem you have, you mentioned Bush. Uh, Bush is sort of um, losing his campaign in 92 against Clinton on a domestic policy issue. So you have, again, the same fear. What if the Americans uh, turn on their heels and, and are not helping us? So again, the sort of how do you, how do you keep the U.S. locked in Europe? Because you need them. And I think... Uh, in, in, in that regards, we have to see Volker Rühr's speech at the IISS in London uh, in, in uh, February or March 1993, where he says uh, we need an Eastern enlargement of, the, of NATO. And, and because if you enlarge NATO, it becomes such an important process, the Americans need to be on board. They have to be. And once the debate starts, the Americans, you see in the Clinton administration, initially, they don't really have a plan, but then they start coming up with something that is partnership for peace. So you have the Americans engaged. And, and, and that is, I think, um, one of the core um, principles of, um, of Kohl that he thought we have to engage Russia. Germany becomes very important uh, as a business partner, uh, not, not necessarily as a business partner, initially as a political partner, and you have to engage Russia but you also have to engage the um, reform states of Central and Eastern Europe, and you have to keep the Americans in. So uh, he was trying to, to square the, the circle and, and get everything done. And uh, we can debate if he was successful or not, but the idea to defend the West is very much uh, stick to what worked and find new ways to secure prosperity. And uh, his his bilateral relationship with uh, with Yeltsin is also very complex. And you see that he often said, yes, I know he's not a perfect Democrat, but we need to be aware what good is it if we stabilize Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltics, if Russia goes loose and off tracks and becomes an imperial revisionist power again. And don't make a mistake, they're very clear in Bonn that Russia is again on a track to a nationalist revisionist uh, power already in 1993 1994 it is not that there's a long gloomy period with yeltsin it's very clear and at, at least at, at latest in in 94 that russia is becoming more expansionist and this is even before chechnya right you have already other signs that that russia is um, sort of playing foul again so that's very much, Kohl says, what, what good is it? He often speaks of the balkanization of the Soviet Union and then also of the balkanization of Russia. So his big fear, and that plays to your first point really about not another war, is his idea what happens if Russia goes off rails and there's a civil war with nukes that is very bad. So, so the idea of stability is, and he often talks about the Marshall Plan for all kind of different world regions, but he always um, compares, as an historian, he compares what happened uh, or what is happening in Russia or what is supposed to happen in Russia and with Russia to Germany after 1945. Sort of engage them, help them economically and politically so they can march on their, stand on their own feet and march on their own feet towards progress in terms of market reforms and democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I would like to see if there are other raised hands. If they are, at the moment they are not, uh, it seems to me so. So I would like to make uh, a question myself. I have a curiosity uh, about the use of words in politics. It is peace and security. Uh, Two key concepts, also in today's debate, uh, do they combine? Are they in contrast? Uh, according to what I would call a defensist position, they do combine. According to the pacifist classical view, no, they contrast each other. Uh, so they are used in politics as symbols, signals. Uh, during the Cold War, security became a keyword in the West. Uh, of course, because peace 
was the key word for the East. Uh, and even in a certain sense, even the pacifist movements accepted the framework of security more than the framework of integral pacifists. Uh, everybody, I think, among us remember remembers the slogan, uh, better red than dead. And better red than dead is not an ethical, moral uh, invitation, is a fundamental need uh, up to a sort of primitive necessity, life, that is security as life. So my question is, according to your experience, your studies, uh, what kind of combination in the CDU tradition there is uh, between peace and security? Uh, what kind of accents? Did they try to combine them in what way? Thank you very much. Um, difficult question to answer because it's such a good question. Um, I'll, I'll try my very best. Um, I mean, we speak nowadays um, of a full spectrum concept of security right mm -hmm. societal security domestic security internet security and i think that the terms of human security and how to protect your inner working of democracy becomes already important during the cold war because at the end of the day it's also a contest for ideas and for freer societies and uh, if I may um, go off rail on, 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 a, on a different subject, um, I, I wrote, um, I just finished a, a book on the, the Schengen Agreement, so the free movement of people the, across borders, and the, the idea of freedom as in having peace and prosperity, but also just freedom of the individual, right, the role of the individual that is free to move, was a concept that was also used in the East, but not really a reality in the socialist bloc, even though you could, there were tourists, yes, but of course it was very different than uh, in, in Western Europe. So there was always that contest about freedom and who is, who's the freer society. And uh, I think that's, that's one argument I would say the, um, the peace is more than absence of war. And the, the concept, um, uh, if you think of um, Strauss or Kohl, it was always clear um, there's no good in having a society that is um, fully secure and, and fully sort of militarized when there is no freedom. freedom. So the, the, the concept of freedom, I think, is um, links to both concepts um, very much, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, it makes real sense and it links to our previous seminar, human rights in a certain sense. You can have, no. this was what came from the East, but you are repeating this, you can have no peace if you if human rights are violated and not respected. So, and human rights as freedom are ingredients, fundamental ingredients of any peace. Yeah, and and then sorry if I may add, and, and then uh, I mean if if we talk about these concepts, you have the OSCE process, right? That's Helsinki uh, in in a nutshell, um, and yes. that is also something. Um, where the Christian Democrats, I would argue, were initially a bit more hesitant because it wasn't within their traditional understanding, but then became also um, a clear uh, proponent of the process. Thank you very much. May I, may I add uh, one, one uh, aspect to this? Uh, of course. I think, uh, the the um, uh, item of, uh, of peace is in a certain way being corrupted by by the socialists and by the social democrats, uh, as well as by the communists, of course. Uh, they presented herself um, or themselves uh, as uh, pacifists on the one hand, but in the uh, conservative, in the Christian democratic uh, sense, it always means indeed the absence of uh, a war in the classic definition and it means a lot of uh, uh, social security uh, as well as social market uh, economy concept uh, is, a, is a part of this and uh, goes 
Fabian, the uh, traditional explanation of uh, war and peace, uh, or peace and war, uh, and in so far, the 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 item of of detente was a transition period, of course, going back to the situation before the First World War, perhaps uh, before the situation in the nineteenth century. And then you have to uh, rather look to the uh, uh, attitude uh, of the Catholic Church. Uh, uh, what uh, did they? thought about peace and war. And they always thought war was necessary to uh, uh, defend uh, our religion, of course. And it is a still going item up to now uh, in how far is it possible uh, to uh, secure for people, for minorities, the freedom of religion and uh, the inner security, the feeling I'm secure, I can uh, do what I want, and I can uh, have my religion uh, as well. Uh, it is uh, not only a political, but as well a social um, aspect, I think, uh, we have to discuss uh, when we are uh, talking about peace and war uh, in the Christian democratic way. And because we are very interested in, in the question, what is the specific Christian democratic um, way uh, to this fundamental uh, uh, problem of, of peace and war? And how can we answer or find answers uh, to this? Absolutely. Thank you. We have still one minute. I don't know if there is. Uh, some more requests for interventions or comments? Well, it seems not. Okay, I, I think uh, I have to thank you all, beginning with Professor Shanna for his very interesting suggestions and then all the people who intervene and proposed Professor Coosters and the good debate, I think. Uh, we will inform you about the next calendar of these webinars that will continue in late September and October, we hope. Uh, and so that's all. Thank you again very much. And all my greetings, the warmest greetings to you all. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, very nice holidays, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much again. Bye bye. bye. bye.